we are going to talk about the tabernacle. And uh, before we get started, I want to give you a little health warning here. It came across an email a while back. I think it's very important. This is a, a health warning for you not to swallow bubble gum. <laughs> now, the reason I show you this is because really this tabernacle is, in sense, kind of like a health warning. You see, the Bible isn't there just for, to collect dust and sit on a shelf. The Bible is there because it is good for us. And it's not healthy for us as Christians to go through this life without being in that word, without understanding things. And the more we study this tabernacle, the more you are going to see some very good health advice for the Christian. And that's what we want to look at here today. Do you know that the tabernacle is spoken of in over 50 chapters of Scripture? There is more information, more chapters dedicated to the tabernacle than any other topic of all Scripture outside of Jesus Christ himself. The tabernacle is usually one of those things that we're bored to death to talk about. We, we hate reading through Exodus. We don't want to read through that stuff when you get to the, to the tabernacle. That's boring. Well, guys, if something is boring to you in the Scriptures, I want to tell you something. It's, it's only boring because you don't know enough about it. But the more you study it, the more you're going to see that there is indeed rich uh, blessings that await as we study this tabernacle. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, it says that there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve at the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. In other words, what this is telling us is that the tabernacle is a copy of the heavenly things. A copy of heaven. We're, we love to talk about heaven. I mean, we want to know what heaven's going to be like, yet when we talk about the tabernacle, we're bored, and yet the Bible is saying the tabernacle is a copy of heaven, ultimately. It goes on, and it says, As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. God was very specific about what this tabernacle was to look like. And guys, I want you to see that God showed him what the tabernacle was to look like. Where? Up on the mountain. What mountain? Mount Sinai, where he was receiving the Ten Commandments. Now, one of the things God told them to do was that when you set up this tabernacle, you are to make sure that the twelve tribes are to camp around it. But three of those twelve tribes are to camp directly north, three directly south, three directly east, three directly west. It would look something like this here. Now, if you would have taken an icon, say like a little tent here, and assigned that icon for so many people, the Bible tells us in the book of Numbers how many people there are in each tribe. See them listed here. That means that if you would have flown over the wilderness over that tabernacle in an airplane way back in the, the time that Moses was there, this is what it would have looked like. Isn't that amazing? Even this is telling you what this tabernacle is speaking of. It is speaking of Jesus. It is speaking of the cross. It is speaking of eternal life, and Jesus is eternal life. And that's what the tabernacle is. It, the tabernacle equals eternal life. Eternal life equals Jesus. As I said, he came down the mountain with these blueprints. What that means is Moses didn't just bring the Ten Commandments down with him. We always think Moses, Ten Commandments, law. Jesus, gospel. Old Testament, law. New Testament, gospel. No. Old Testament, law, and gospel. New Testament, law, and gospel. When he came down the mountain, he brought the law and the gospel with him because he was bringing down the very blueprints of this tabernacle. I think that's a very important point for us to remember, that the tabernacle is indeed the gospel and that came down on Mount Sinai. There are seven pieces of furniture, six primarily, that were listed here in the tabernacle. And in the upper left here, you will see that there's a cross that's laid out in red. That cross shows you how the articles of furniture were laid out in the tabernacle, in a cross shape. And you will see that as we go along. Well, if I would have been there in the wilderness and wanted to go see the tabernacle, the very first thing that I would run into would be this here. It's the gate. 
There was only one way to get into the tabernacle, only one. You couldn't go over it, you couldn't go under it, you had to go in through the gate, and there was only one gate on the east side. Why the east? Well, east is a very symbolic direction, scripturally speaking. In the Garden of Eden, there was a cherub that was placed in the garden to guard the gate to the Garden of the Eden, but it was on the east side. Apparently only one way to get into the Garden of Eden. When Cain was fleeing from God, he fled west, away from God's presence. When Jonah was fleeing from God, he fled west, away from God's presence. Likewise, we see in Jerusalem today the Golden Gate. Sometimes it's called the Eastern Gates. They're kind of closed up there with bricks. The reason that is is because it is believed that when the Messiah returns, he is supposed to go through the Eastern Gate. And when he goes through that Eastern Gate... The Muslims thought, we can't have the Messiah coming back, so we're going to keep him from doing so by putting a cemetery, dead bodies in front of it. So you can see that there is a cemetery directly in front of it. But what they don't realize is that my God is the God of the living and the dead. It's not going to stop him. Now, interestingly as well, if you'd gone straight through that gate, it seems that that's exactly where the Ark of the Covenant would have been, uh, the Holy of Holies, right through that eastern gate. It would line up perfectly, the best we can tell through archaeology anyway. But this gate represents Jesus. How? Because Jesus is the only way into heaven. Remember, the tabernacle is a picture of heaven. How do you get into heaven? Only one way. Jesus. It tells us in John 10, 9 that I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. You can't get into heaven any other way but going through Jesus, the door. And so that's what we're getting a picture of here. Now, the first thing that you'd see as you went through the gate, you would run into what was called the brazen altar. Now, this brazen altar was made of wood, but it was covered in bronze. The only place that you were ever to make a sacrifice was right here on this altar. Look what it says here in Leviticus 17. Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or a lamb or goat and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle, that man shall be cut off from among the people. In other words, if you made an offering any place else, you were to be cut off. That's pretty serious, to be cut off from God's people. So I would say it's pretty important that you don't try and make a sacrifice anywhere else. But I'm going to propose to you that many in the church try to do that. They're trying to make some other sacrifices to get to heaven. Oh, if I only do this, then I'll be a good Christian and Jesus will love me then. No, it is the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone that's going to get you to heaven. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We are cursed if we don't go through the altar of Jesus Christ. We also had these walls that were around there. Now the walls pretty much were like kind of a tent thing, a cloth covering, but each one had a pole and everything like that. Like I said, you couldn't go under, you couldn't go over. You had to go all the way around to get through the gate. But once you're in... You need to stop at this altar. It's the very first thing you're going to do. You can see here that there are horns on this altar. We will discuss some of those things later. But right now, I want to talk about what it was made of. As I said, wood. What does wood represent scripturally? We often see it representing humanity. Bronze. Bronze represents two things in scripture. One, judgment. And two, deity. Likewise, Jesus was full man and full God. We read in Psalm chapter 16, Therefore my heart is glad, my heart rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption or decay. God promised, He says, I am not going to let my Holy One, Jesus, the Messiah, see decay. Just as when they would put this animal on this altar, they would have a, be fires inside this brazen altar. How come it didn't burn the wood up? Because the deity, the bronze, protected the wood. Just as the Godhead, the divinity of God or, or of Christ protected him and God did not allow Yeshua Jesus to see decay. The divinity protected the humanity 
Now, as I said, bronze also represents judgment. And all the works that we do on our own are going to be burned. You know, Isaiah tells us all our righteous acts will be like filthy rags in God's sight, right? Not our sinful acts, our righteous acts. That means the very best that you can give God on your own is like a filthy rag, a bloody rag. That's what the scriptures tell us. Even the best you can give on your own. Only in Christ can we please God. Only in Christ are we made right before God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, it says, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. In other words, the description we see of Jesus as he's coming back is this. He is coming with feet like burnished bronze to trample and judge the earth. His eyes like flaming fire to pierce and to be able to see the hearts of men, the thoughts we read in James chapter 2, verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. I got news for you guys. When Jesus comes back, he is going to judge you by the works that you have done. And as James says, you can keep the whole law but stumble at just one point and you've broken it all and you will deserve judgment in eternal hell. Unless you have Jesus Christ, His blood, who has not only covered but taken away the sins that you have so that you can stand before God holy, righteous, blameless, pure. Anything you do on your own will burn. We need Jesus. And guys, you may say, well, I believe in Jesus. I've gone through the gate. I have entered through Jesus. I have stopped at this altar. I accept the sacrifice that Jesus has done for me on that cross at Calvary. Great. You know what? You might be saved because you're in the door, but don't you want to be sanctified? Sanctified is a fancy church word that simply means to be made holy. I think there are a lot of people in the churches today who... Well, frankly, they are saved, but not sanctified. They're saved because they believe in Jesus, but do you know that this tabernacle is a lot larger than just this little bit, you know, entering the gate and stopping at the altar? There's a lot more to it. Why? If all God wanted for you to do was believe in Jesus and stop there, then the tabernacle would have been very small, but there's a lot more to this. Why? Why? Because he wants you to be sanctified. Now another thing you need to understand about this altar too is that who built it? Did God build the altar? No, man built the altar. God told Moses this is how you are to build it. Not only that, but the cross that Jesus was placed on was man-made, wasn't it? But the judgment that was placed on it that didn't come from man. That came from a special source. Fire represents judgment as well. Now, when they would burn these animals on this altar, where'd they get the fire? I mean, it's not like they have little Bic lighters trying to get a cow on. I don't know if you've ever tried to burn an animal, you know, alive like that, or burn an animal. They weren't alive, but even a dead animal. Have you ever tried to burn one? Good. <laughs> I'd wonder about you. But bottom line is, they wouldn't burn very well. Oh, do you think they were rubbing sticks together to try and get some fire going to put this thing on? No. Where'd the fire come from? Look what the Bible tells us. It says right here in Leviticus 9, 24, fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and they fell on their faces. <laughs> it came out of heaven. If I see fire coming out of heaven, I'm going to you know, get down on my face and worship God too. And that's what they did. That fire was only to come from God. Man could make the cross, but man could not pass judgment on Jesus. That judgment had to come from God, which is why Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the wrath of God that you deserved, Jesus was taking upon himself. This is why we see Aaron had two sons, Nadab and Abihu, and it tells us in the Bible that they were killed because they offered unauthorized fire in Leviticus 10. Unauthorized fire. What's unauthorized fire? Fire that came from your hands, not God. That's why they died, because man can't judge 
the salvation of a person. Only Jesus can do that. That fire also, once it came down, it never went out. The fire was to keep burning at all times. As a matter of fact, if they would you know, pack up the tabernacle and move on, they would take coals from the altar and take those coals with them to the next spot. We don't see that they ever used the fire from their own hands. Even when Solomon made that tabernacle a permanent thing called the temple, when they dedicate it, fire comes out of heaven, just like it did here in Leviticus 10. The fire on the altars were never to go out because that fire, that judgment of God is what brings forgiveness. And likewise, we are to always remember that that forgiveness is always available for us. The animals that were placed on that, man would kill them, man would place them on there. Jesus was placed on the cross by man, but it was a voluntary sacrifice. Look what it says in Isaiah 53, verse 7. It says of Jesus that he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't fight this. They couldn't have put Jesus on the cross unless he let them do so. Hebrews tells us this in chapter 9, verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He did it himself. It wasn't man that did it, Jesus. You know, we have that argument when the Passion came out, was it the Jews or the Romans that put Jesus on the cross? My answer is really neither. It, it kind of goes both, it's either all or none. It was all of our sins that put him there, but we didn't do it. It was Jesus willing, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God put him on that cross. Now we also see that there are horns, as I said, on that altar. We've heard that that was to tie down the sacrifice. No, a dead animal isn't getting off the altar. That had more symbolic meaning than practical purpose. What we read in Psalm 18, verse 2 of the gospel in Jesus is this, that he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Scripturally speaking, horns represent power. They represent the gospel. The gospel is power. Okay, we see that we are being saved by the power of God. And it, he is, Jesus is the horn of my salvation. So not only do we see the, the aspect of how the sacrifice is to be killed, but we even see who it is, the horn of our salvation always set before us. You see, Jesus' sacrifice was much better than these bull offerings and rams and goats. Look what it says here in Hebrews again, in chapter 9, verses 25 through 26. Jesus was the sacrifice once. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Those priests, day after day after day, were making sacrifices. Every year on the Day of Atonement, went into the most holy place to make a sacrifice. But Jesus, he's a better sacrifice. He doesn't have to do it over and over. He does it once. He died once for all, and death no longer has mastery over him, it says in Romans. The other thing is, is there was no chair in this tabernacle for a good reason. The priests could never rest. They were constantly making sacrifices day after day, three times a day. And sometimes even more than that because of certain festivals. It was a busy job. Being a priest was a hard job. But Jesus, being a better sacrifice, look what the scriptures say he did after making his sacrifice Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus said it is finished on that cross for a reason. 
because he made one sacrifice of himself and it was a better sacrifice so that now there is no need for any more sacrifice. This is why it says in Hebrews 9.23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, that's the tabernacle, should be purified with these, the blood of animals. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Jesus is that better sacrifice. And His blood purified our heavenly home. The copies were done by animals. Well, another interesting aspect is that this is an ugly tabernacle. There was nothing that would attract you to this tabernacle. If you were out there in the desert and you saw this, you wouldn't be saying, oh man, I would love to go see what's in there. That's beautiful. It had a drab outside. You couldn't see all the gold that was on the inside, the beautiful linen that had cherub woven into it. You couldn't see the beauty. You only got to see the ugly. This is the way Christianity is, guys. You know, I think we make a big mistake in our churches sometimes because we try to attract the world by making the church look beautiful. We're hoping that the beauty of the church is going to attract people in. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus did. I'll show you in a minute. Jesus was ugly. He didn't want people coming to him because he was pretty. Jesus was ugly. It says in John 3, 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot understand the gospel of God. The natural man doesn't care what's in your church. They're foolishness to him. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He's saying, your beauty that you try and make your churches all beautiful for, if people are coming into the church, they won't see the beauty anyway. They're not going to see it unless they first repent and come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then what's inside a church building, then it becomes beautiful. Then they will see these walls that were on the side. These walls even have meaning. And I'm not going to get into too much detail. I could be here for three days talking about this tabernacle if we looked at all these details. But real quick, I just want you to see that there was a rope that went down and there was a peg that was fastened into the ground. Isaiah 22 speaks of Jesus saying, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. It was the love of Jesus that basically tied and held that tabernacle down. Hosea 11.4 says, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. Ropes, the pins, all of this is pointing to Jesus and the gospel. Now, to give you an idea of what this looked like, I just want you to see a picture here that there's the door. You would walk through the door. You believe in Jesus. That's your entrance into heaven. You believe on the sacrifice of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. You offer nothing on your own. You don't make a sacrifice anywhere else, but you believe that Jesus and Jesus alone is what the sacrifice has to be for you to be saved. Like I said, you can see here that there's a lot more to this tabernacle. And I want to ask you this today. Are you content hanging out there at that altar? Are you content sitting here, hanging out in the outer court of the tabernacle? Because what you had is this outer court that you can see, but then there's that little building-like structure where there are two buildings inside that, the holy place and the most holy place. But you can't go in unless you go a little bit further and meet a couple of other requirements. What are those requirements? Well, We'll discuss that in a minute, but I want you to see 
these walls that were in that inside building. They were about 15 feet high each board and about two and a half feet wide. You can see that there was a silver base at the bottom. Each board had two pegs. One peg went into one of the silver bases, the other peg into the next one so that they would interlock like that. What's fascinating is that they get that silver for those bases from where? They're in the desert. Right, the Egyptians. When they left Egypt, they plundered the Egyptians, didn't they? They went to the houses and say, hey, we're leaving. Can we have some gold and silver? And they were like, yeah, here, take it all. Get out of here. They were happy to get rid of the Israelites out of Egypt. They were happy to give them their things. And that was part of God's plan. He even said, I'm going to make, I'm going to plunder the Egyptians. So that not only did he destroy their crops, he took everything they had. He destroyed their economy completely. Well, after they get these gifts from God, they go out into the wilderness and God says, um, I'd kind of like that silver back. Did they say, oh, oh, you just gave it to me? No, they gladly gave it back. Gladly. And as I'll show you, sometimes when God blesses us, He expects us to give back. And when we do with a joyful heart, He blesses and takes care of us. It tells us in Exodus 38, verse 25, that the silver that was obtained was one becca per person. That is a half shekel from everyone who had crossed over. A total of 603,550 men. And it goes on there to say that the reason they were to give this becca of silver was because it was an, a price of atonement that they were to pay. In other words, what is silver representing? It's a price of atonement. Now, out of those that silver, they made 100 silver bases. Each base weighed 100 pounds. You add up all the silver there was for 603,550 people. It is just slightly over five tons. What did they do with the rest of it? There were some clasps that held up the curtains that those were used for. In Leviticus 17.11, it tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement. In other words, what is the biblical picture of atonement? Blood. I have given you blood for atonement. And he says now, as a price of atonement, since I'm not going to have you shed your blood, give me silver instead. Therefore, we're seeing silver, again, is the price of atonement, the blood of Jesus. It says in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hebrews 9, 22, it says, without the shedding of blood there can be no remission or forgiveness of sins. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Shepherd the church which he purchased with his own blood. The foundation of the tabernacle and temple, what was it? Silver, blood, atonement. The foundation of the church today can be none other than the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. That's the foundation that you see here. Not only did those walls again have a silver base, but they were covered with something. Four different articles. The very first one was linen with cherubs engraved into it, then some goat hair, then some ram skin, and then some porpoise skin. The first one here, the linen, it had blue and these cherub that were embroidered into there beautifully. Now, cherub are only seen one place in Scripture, at the throne of God. Go look it up. You'll see it. In Ezekiel 10.1, it says, Above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. We see the throne of God, and the cherub are there. In the Garden of Eden, where do we see that the 